Hello everyone and welcome to Cook With Me Live. We are making AJ's potato salad today. Now, you might be wondering what is AJ's? Yeah, I know, it's, it's the namesake. Um, it's a potato salad recipe that is kind of adapted and evolved from something that was an absolute favorite of mine as a kid. So this is a recipe that my mother used to make. She had a famous potato salad. She would bring it to, I guess, anywhere that it would suit to bring a potato salad. I guess I've adapted it over the years to include more vegetables, a little bit more kind of healthy combinations, give you more options. And I've also tweaked the dressing a little bit to make it a little bit lighter. So this is probably not your quintessential Australian potato salad. I will admit it probably has nothing to do with Australia itself, but I've had some very lackluster potato salad since I've been to Australia. So I wanted to bring this out. I know it might otherwise seem like a simple recipe, but there are definitely a few things that I can show you to make your life a lot easier when it comes to making salads, in particular ones that involve these so-called poor darling maligned potatoes. I feel so bad that these poor little things are getting such a bad rap nowadays and everyone is trying so hard to avoid the carbs and they're being told to avoid the potatoes. And I really don't think it's necessarily the best idea. The other cool thing about potatoes, well, Let's wait till we get into it. I'll share with that as we go. So uh, we are gonna be making potato salad. I'm gonna be showing you how to make the dressing from scratch. So we're not gonna be taking any shortcuts here. The reason for this is so that you can make a dressing that you actually feel good about eating because it's not full of numbers and preservatives and additives and all that kind of other dodgy food chemical stuff that they're now including in many dressings off the shelf. So we are gonna be making the mayonnaise from scratch. So even if you're interested in this recipe video simply so that you can learn how to make a mayonnaise, we're gonna go from scratch. And I'm going to use this device which is just a miniature food processor, essentially. Um, I actually don't think that this model is actually available anymore, but I do love it. Um, and we're gonna be using this because it has this special little mayonnaise, uh, I guess, feature to it. So this little hole lets only a certain tiny, tiny amount of oil through at a time. And it makes the mayonnaise process a lot easier and a lot less likely to fail. That being said, if it happens and if the mayonnaise flops, which it still does every now and then on me, depending on the weather or who knows what, I think the last one might've been a certain Dijon mustard I was using that had turmeric in it. I'm guessing that had something to do with the flopping of the mayonnaise. But anyways, there's always a way to, to work it and to salvage it. So if that happens today, then I'll show you how to salvage it. If not, I'll talk you through it. You ready? Let's get started. Cause we actually need to get the potatoes cooking um, cause they're going to take the longest, I guess, for this part of the recipe. So those of you that are lo just logging in or just kind of finding this re recipe now, I'd love to know, first of all, as usual, where are you cooking from? Who's in the kitchen maybe with you? And are you actually cooking with me now? Or are you just going to watch the video first and then, and then watch uh, cook along later? So we'd love to hear your the thoughts on that. And if you guys don't mind these types of videos that I do, I put a lot of time and energy into to make them extremely valuable for you. So if you have groups that you're in that you think this would be a value to them, please feel free to, to take a moment and share that into the group right now. It's a pretty easy little button you can click onto and share and maybe just share a little message about why you think this video will help them. That'd be really wonderful. Would love to help as many people as we can. Okay, so first steps first, we're gonna get the potatoes boiling. Um, nice and easy, this is not a recipe where they need to be roasted. So sometimes there is an advantage for certain salads in particular that we roast the vegetables instead of boiling them for the purpose of making that extra sweetness and that extra flavor. But in the case of this salad, it is okay to boil them. But the thing that most people tend not to do I shouldn't say it's not to do well, it's fine to do it this way, but it's a little bit wasteful of water and it's actually gonna take you longer, is they're going to fully submerge the potatoes in the water. You do not need to do that. If we're gonna be boiling potatoes, they only really need to be kind of half submerged in water, if not even a little bit more, maybe two thirds of water um, up to their level. So it's really not a lot of water that you need at all. We just need to make sure they don't boil dry. Other than that, as long as the lid's on, the steam, Steam is actually hotter than water, believe it or not. The steam is hotter than the boiling water because it's steam. So we only need to keep that steam in there to continue cooking the ones on top. So it's probably much less water than you think you originally needed to boil any vegetable for that matter, okay? If we, if we cook with the lid on. So I've just got maybe, that's probably not even a quarter of the way full for this pot. Um, so that's just a little time saving trick, water saving trick, and especially energy when it comes to, you know, if you're cooking with ca uh, gas or electricity, it'll save the amount of time to get that to the boil. So we're just gonna get that ready. The only step I've done in advance is to wash the potatoes because that can take a few little moments. So I have given them a good scrub and now I'm just gonna spot peel them. So these ones do happen to be 
organic potatoes. So I'm just going to take a couple of the suspicious spots off that might that, that I think might go deeper than skin surface. And that's only, you know, sometimes you'll get, for example, this one right here, that might go a little bit deeper than skin surface. We'll just see. Nope, we're good. But if ever they do go deeper than skin surface, you can keep peeling until you get down, down to the good bits. But we just need to spot peel. We do not need to get rid of all, see there's one, that's gonna go a little bit deeper than skin deep. Okay, so we'll just keep, oh, it didn't even, that's, that's impressive. Okay, so we just do this to um, make sure we don't end up with any bad bits in our salad. But ideally, we wanna keep as much of that skin as possible um, if, they're, if they're organic. And sometimes, look at that one, I didn't even see that one. That can happen too in any, any old potato, whether it's organic or not, so we do wanna make sure we get rid of that. We would have seen that one if we'd have cut it up, but this is just a little step we can do. So a couple of spot peels. Now, coming back to the topic of potatoes, again, these poor little maligned creatures. Um, I might have already mentioned this one a couple of times to you on Cook With Me Lives, but um, there is a man, you can look him up. Um, I think his name might be Andrew, uh, but he goes by Spudfit, Mr. Spudfit. And um, very interesting story to listen to if you can get a hold of, um, of a podcast or anything that he's done. Uh, to listen to his story about Spudfit because what he did is literally ate nothing but potatoes for an entire year and he ended up better off than when he began. So he was doing it for reasons associated with uh, food addiction and obesity and it did solve the problem and fix that up for him but literally for an entire year uh, he ate nothing but potatoes. All different kinds of potatoes but I think he had a little bit of salt and maybe the odd little bit of oil with them. But other than that, it was literally just potatoes for an entire year. And he did his re research to figure out which food that he could successfully choose to do that with for an entire year and end up okay at the end, if not ideally better off than when he began. And the potato was the one that, that he chose because the potato has the most complete form of nutrition and it had the best ability for him to, I guess, maintain all of his equal levels of the vitamins, the minerals, and everything that he needed. So it's very interesting because we malign this poor little potato and we make it out to be this bad carb, when really it's actually quite a, a healthy food. It's obviously not something that we wanna be dunking in a, in a deep fryer all the time and eating soaked in oil and salt, not to mention dodgy oil and dodgy salt. But the point here is that it definitely can be a very nutritious food, um, especially for growing kids. So if you're making your own um, potatoes, or in this case, the potato salad, just let the kids go for it. I mean, maybe the rule in that case is that the potato salad has to come with all these other vegetables that we're gonna sneak into it. And it's not just potatoes and, you know, a mayonnaise, which is largely just oil, right? But the idea here is that the potato does contain a lot of valuable nutrition in it. So let's not totally eliminate it out of our diet. And an interesting fact about potato in particular, I'd actually be interested to ask you guys, maybe you have time to type this in before I will uh, give you the answer, is what do you think, which mineral are potatoes particularly good for? Okay, so if you guys wanna type that in, what you think your best guess is. If there's young ones in the kitchen, maybe ask them to have a good guess if they know what a mineral answer might look like. But which mineral uh, are potatoes particularly really high in comparative, compared to other foods? Okay, so I'll let you have a little think about that one and I'll have to remember to come back to that one. You guys can remind me. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing and I think it surprises most people to find that this is a source of that mineral. So we'll come back to that. Okay, so yeah, back to the potato. The sweet potato we've added in for texture difference, for color difference, and obviously for taste difference. So yes, it is a bit sweeter. And then for some people that are a little bit concerned about the starch content of a potato, which is classified as a carb, then you can be offsetting that with a little bit of the, the sweet potato as well, okay? But it's very interesting. Most people don't realize and understand what carbs really are. So the, the, the term carbohydrate actually encompasses three different things. So it's made up of sugars, starches, but also fiber. So you can have something be, be classified as a, as a carb, but it's actually just really, really high in fiber. So technically speaking, crackers made from flax meal and 
nut, uh, well, maybe not so much nuts, but, but from flax meal, chia seeds, that kind of thing. If you just had crackers made from that, those would be a complete carb, but it's almost pure fiber and other amazing goodness. So you wouldn't want to avoid that type of carb. So the point there is they're not all created equal. And definitely things that are processed sugars, like processed carbohydrates, now that's the one you want to try and minimize at the very least. But something like a good old potato, let's include a little bit in our diet. So I'll, I'll get back to that now that you guys have maybe um, had a little stake at answering that question. Ooh, I kind of had a little bit of a Freudian slip there. <laughs> Most people think that they should eat steak for this mineral. This mineral that the potatoes are actually higher in is iron. So believe it or not, potatoes are higher, higher in iron per gram than steak. That was a bit of a Freudian slip. That was kind of cool. Didn't plan that one. Um, so anyways, yes, eat your potatoes, enjoy them. They're decadent, they're delicious. Uh, we don't have to go overboard. And in this case, we're going to completely cover them in other vegetables as well. All right, here we go. So I'm just chopping away just little bite-sized pieces. The smaller we get them, I guess the faster they'll cook, but keep in mind the mouth feel of how you want to bite into a, piece, uh, a fork full of potato salads. You probably don't want it to be too small, but at the same time, um, I have seen most potato salads have really, really chunky pieces of potato, which means that when you bite into the fork full, all you're getting is a big hunk of potato as opposed to a nice balance of the other flavors. So maybe not too big either. All right, nice little cubes. <clears throat> if you end up getting super organized and your family loves eating lots of potatoes, you might get yourself one of those professional or commercial French fry cutters. In that case, you'll get perfectly sized squares. Okay. I could have had that water on the boil and brought these potatoes back to it to really speed that up. That probably would have been faster, but we'll just do it this way. So lid on, notice how by the time I put the potatoes in, that water actually rose up nearly to the level of these potatoes, and it will usually do that. So we did not even need that much water in that pot. We could drain some of that if we wanted. But we'll get that onto the boil straight away. Actually, I might do that just to show you the difference, and it will speed up the cooking. So I'm just gonna drain a little bit of that water away. There we go. Okay, so biggest burner, highest heat, no need to come back. We'll just get that happening. And while those are boiling away, we can get the rest of the salad ready to go. Okay, so we've got our sweet potato in, we've got our regular potato in. Now let's put some celery. Again, this is like one of those vegetables that I find is just not that, it's not given a lot of love, uh, especially in Australia. Why, I'm not sure. I love it, but maybe that's because I grew up loving it. One way that you might enjoy it more though is if you store it submerged in water in the fridge. So that's why my celery is the shape is because I had cut it to perfectly fit in the container that I had in the fridge. And that's why it's wet is because it's literally come out of water. So if you store it in water, it will last much longer. We're talking like two or three weeks, but you might have to change the water every five or six days or so uh, to make sure it doesn't go slimy and gross, okay? So we're looking for approximately four stems worth of celery. Again, that depends on how much you love it or don't love it. If it's not your favorite thing, try to still include it so that your taste buds have a chance of, of liking it, but just cut, the thing, cut them smaller. So even after you cut it as thin as you can get it, you might still take the knife through and rock chop it to break it down even further. And then with this end bit, if you really don't wanna use the very end bit, save it for your broth. So this can now go into my little freezer bag for broth. That actually looks really quite nice. I might decorate this salad with that. So yeah, coming back to my point before, if you don't love biting into celery in particular, just give it a little rock chop through the pile and that way it won't be as overpowering of a specific bite of celery when you bite into it. So there we go. All right, and now it's probably recommended if you build this in a bowl that's much bigger than what you might be serving it in, but this way it's gonna let you create the mess and create the, the mixture 
without spilling over the edges with a lot more ease. And then you can transfer it into your decorative bowl after. Okay, so we've got our celery. You could also have used the mandolin, but the mandolin for celery will not work if your celery is droopy. It'll actually be really dangerous. So by soaking the celery in water and leaving it in water in the fridge, it'll be nice and firm and crisp and it'll be very easy to cut with a mandolin safely. So that's another option that you'd have. Um, let's use that for the radish because the radish goes really quickly with the mandolin. And this is probably another food that might not be on your regular weekly list. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm wrong and you love your radishes, but I guess I remember being introduced to radish at quite a young age with dad in the garden, as usual, because radish guys, those of you that do have a bit of garden space, the radishes are the first to come up. So they're ready to harvest in four weeks after planting from seed. So you can put these little seeds into the ground and in four weeks, watch them fully mature into sprout, into plant, into develop plant. And meanwhile, they're developing their little beautiful radish root down the bottom. And uh, for kids, especially to get them excited about things, that's actually, it's a really good food to start with. They might not actually end up eating lots of them, but if you grow them quickly and grow them with enough water and kind of, they grow plump and juicy, then they're less likely to be really strong as well. It's usually only when they stay in the ground a lot longer that they get quite strong and quite, well, radishy. <laughs> I think nowadays they're trying to breed the radish out of the radish and they don't want strong ones. Anyways, pop it on the uh, hat and let's do some nice thin slices of radish. Another one, pop it on. So very easy to get those evenly thin slices using the tool for the job. But just another option. Works well with mushrooms. Works well with baby squash. Anything that you can kind of pop on. There we go. Okay, and then with those end bits, we could give them a little hand slice if we needed, or we could just eat them. Put a little bit of salt on them and eat them. But the tops can tend to be a little bit tougher. There we go. We won't waste those bits either. Now, if you don't like these red radish too, another option could be to get yourself some Japanese radish or the daikon radish. And sometimes they're really mild. Um, sometimes they're quite spicy. So one thing you probably wanna do, and I probably should have done this before we did them all, is test and see how spicy it is. Yeah, there's nothing to that. So if it's not spicy at all, now just consider it a neutral veggie and let's get as much of it in there as we can because likely the radish contains something that maybe your body could be lacking if you haven't been used to eating a lot of radish in the past. So let's get it in there. Another method of getting more nutrition into you. Okay, now fresh cobs of corn. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, you can eat corn raw. <laughs> And to that I go, yes, and try it, because it's delicious. Um, it's sweet, I, it's, I, I can't describe it until you've had it, you can't describe it, but get it back to the stock, uh, sorry, the cob, and get rid of all the little hairs on it. And then we're just gonna shave the cob of corn. So you can lay it down if you're really unsure how to do this. And we're just gonna try to get into it just to find the edge of the cob on the inside. So it's kind of, you just wanna get that edge where your knife will go through, but only just. And that's how we know we've hit that edge of the cob. Okay, so that's how we know we're not gonna waste the corn. And then you can keep going around and just taking one little bit off at a time. Okay, and if you don't wanna do it that way, you could do it this way, which is a little bit more dangerous, so I wouldn't do this first, is just to shave it off the cob like this can make a bit more of a mess too. <laughs> so just going around, getting as much of it off the cob as you can without wasting. But then if you've got any little kids wandering around the house being bored, <laughs> give them this to gnaw on. Save a little bit of corn on it and give them that to gnaw on because it's uh, quite sweet. And I just think it's totally different to, oh, totally different to when it's cooked. I just about went to put that in the compost, but this is actually really good in your broth as well. So I normally just break it up and leave it for the broth. Give it a bit of sweetness in there too. Okay, so there's our corn. That should get broken up when we toss the salad, 
but you could just give it a little crunch with your hands as you put it in there. Adds a bit of color, but definitely the sweetness. For me, that's the, the magic of adding that bit of corn. Okay, again, all veggies, optional. Okay, now the greens. The part that many kids will probably decide before they even taste it or, <laughs> or touch it that they're not gonna have because of the greens. So this is where you have the option of cutting the greens separate, tossing them in a bowl separately, and letting maybe the adults or the kids try that separately. Okay, so it's not to say that we don't want them to eat it, we just might want to build their confidence and build their trust that they like the salad itself first, and then maybe you could add this in separately. So I've got some dill. Now, normally when I go to make this salad, I will put probably double the amount of dill in there because I absolutely love it. Uh, it might be a very unique flavor for you. I've also got some green onions that have seen better days, but this does not mean they get thrown out. Okay, so the trick here with the green onions is we just clean them up. So we take off the raggy bits by peeling the green onions, okay? And then just pinching off the raggy tops and then we'll give them a rinse as well. But that is definitely not a reason to throw them out even if they get a little bit ratty looking. So I'll give them a little rinse. And look, this salad I think really does need some, uh, some form of the allium family. So if you don't have green onions, you could be using a little bit of finely cut uh, red onion if you wish, or maybe in your garden, you've got some chives. I happen to find some garlic chives, which are these big fat ones. Okay, so fat, uh, fat and flat leaves, or maybe you've got some onion chives, which are the tops basically to um, certain different onion varieties. So these are much more round compared to the garlic chives, as you can see. Okay, so we've got some different options, more of an onion flavor, more of a garlic flavor, and then some parsley. But choose whichever greens you like. I just think it's pretty important because it all adds delicious flavor. And in this case, because I have this extra amount of chives, I'm probably not gonna use the strong bit of the green onion in this recipe. So I'm just gonna take and use the, the green tops which is not too different to those little mini onion chives that I had. And I'll save those for another recipe another day. Okay, so now, now we've, with these greens, we've got long skinny greens here. So you can take advantage of a bit of an efficiency trick and we're going to double up our cutting. So I kind of just mashed all those together. Let me just show you what I'm doing here. We've got dill stems. I pretty much only want the leafy part of the dill. So after you've given it a rinse, I'm just gonna cut down until I get into the really woody part of the stems. It's still edible, but you'll, you'll notice it once they get down to the really woody part. We're good, okay. And with the parsley, depending on how old your parsley plant is, you probably only want to get mostly the leaf as well. This amazing plant, I think is going on a year and a half old at this point and it just keeps producing and producing and producing and I've done nothing to it. So it's kind of nice just to know that I've always got something out there in the garden, but the stems might be a little bit more woody. So I'm gonna align them up. So I've got the woody part starting at the same spot and then I'm just gonna start chopping, okay? And if we really wanted to get efficiency uh, tricks in here, then we might just start cutting these in half as well. So I can double that all up and line this up. There we go. Okay, so I've just lined it all up at once. We're not sitting there doing the same chop six times for six different greens. And it's okay if we get some slightly bigger pieces on this one. It's not like the kale salad, for example, which was pretty particularly needing to be finely chopped. So here we can have a little bit of different uh, size cuts and be perfectly okay. Look at all that green. I wish you could smell this. It's like, oh, for, I don't know what it is about dill. Maybe it's because in the summer we would, we would make our own dill pickles and dilly carrots and dilly beans, dad would call them. And uh, we would just, that smell just completely reminds me of summer. It's amazing, but we'll just start cutting through there. And if I've kind of timed this correctly, ooh, there's a little bonus. 
<laughs> then we should get down to that kind of the stock bit when we finish the onion. There we go. So again, you can chop through this a little bit further if you wish, but at least when you get down to those stem ends, just cut them a little bit finer and then you will not know the difference. The reason for this guys is not just for waste. There's actually a lot of nutrition, sorry, there's a difference in the amount of nutrition in a leaf versus in the stem of something, right? As there is a difference in the seed of something versus the bark versus the, you know, the stock. So there is reason in that and wherever possible it's, you know, it's good. We don't need to throw it away if, if not needed. All right, how are you guys going? Those of you that are cooking along at the same time, you're probably doing a lot less talking and so you're probably further along. Um, I'm curious also, I guess, who, who makes potato salad all the time? And if that's the case, how do you feel about this version? Is this really pushing your bounds? Or, you know, are you excited to try maybe adding a few more things and a little bit more excitement into your potato salad? All right, so I'm gonna keep some of these aside for a little bit of garnish on top. I didn't even measure that. Did you notice that? I just want greens in my salad. You can definitely measure if you wish. I have taken the time in writing the recipe to measure out what we, what we should use as a balanced amount, but I always go more because I absolutely love that extra element. Okay, so that's the salad made. Um, other than the potatoes, of course, which are probably near, well, they're probably not quite near yet, but let's go have a little taste and see where they're at because this is probably one of the little special bits of the recipe that I needed to show you on camera because we do not want to overcook the potatoes. Um, if they get overcooked, then we will end up with a mushy salad, which is not ideal for anyone. <clears throat> okay, so we'll check on them. And note too that um, the sweet potatoes will cook at a different rate to the potato, but in this case, it should be okay. The sweet potatoes will, will manage. They will be done before the potatoes, so always check the potatoes first. Okay. Probably needs about another three or f maybe three to five minutes. When, you, when I bit into that potato, I'll show you maybe this way. You can definitely still get a fork into it. Okay, so the fork, ooh, the fork still goes in, but when you taste it, it still tastes a little bit granular it's not like a nice soft potato so that's not quite ready yet but if ever you're unsure test it every minute um, so that you don't end up with accidentally overcooked potatoes okay so i reckon we're about three minutes away maybe or yeah around about three minutes away from that so we'll see if we can get much of the um, mayonnaise done in that time and then we'll come back and check on it okay so switching into mayonnaise mode so we can make our dressing uh, if you don't have a machine like this, that's okay. You can do it with a regular food processor. Sorry, I shouldn't say regular. It's, it's gonna need to be a small one. Um, and if you don't have a small one, then use an immersion blender or any other machine, any other blender, for example, that you can still be drizzling the oil in while the machine is running. Okay, so mayonnaise is only tricky until you've done it once and you have the setup for it. And then you'll, you'll be amazed. You'll just go, I can't believe I haven't made mayonnaise before in the past. Um, okay, so really simple. Like I said, you just need the right piece of equipment. The key here is that the blades need to bring the oil, the new oil that we pour in, need to bring it under and incorporate it into the emulsion as fast as possible. Because if we put too much oil in too quickly, then the whole thing just flattens. Okay, and yes, we can resurrect it from that point, but it's annoying and it's a pain and we just gotta do more work for that. So the idea here is we kind of set ourselves up for success to begin with, and then you'll have no dramas. Okay, a couple other factors that will flop your mayonnaise uh, could be if your machinery isn't clean or your equipment isn't clean. So make sure that's clean and dry. Um, another factor is if everything is too warm. So if it's a stinking hot day, it's probably not the best time to be making mayonnaise unless everything has just come out of the fridge uh, and, or unless you've got your air conditioning on. Okay, so I'm using the juice from a chickpea tin, if you didn't already realize, and just three tablespoons. So three tablespoons is about the equivalent of a raw egg, and it's enough to uh, get us an emulsion. But before you pour the rest of that out, 
don't, because if it does flop, we'll need more of that to start again. Okay, so that's, um, that's our component of the chickpea juice. Uh, we need Dijon, I forgot to get the Dijon out. Pause, I'm gonna come right back. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you think they're ready? Should we check on them? Okay, we don't want to have overcooked potatoes, you're right. Let's do this. Okay, they're feeling better. Let's see. So close. So close. We could maybe go another minute longer, but what we'll do is I'll just get them draining and the heat of them, um, the heat of them will probably continue to cook them if I don't rinse them in cold water straight away. So let's do that. We'll get them rinsed. So don't take long, right? That wasn't very long at all, unless I lose track of time. <laughs> Talking. Do I talk too much? I kind of have to, don't I? <laughs> I need some of you guys to come and cook with me in the kitchen. How about that? How about we start doing a cook together live? <laughs> if any of you are brave enough to come do that, let me know because I think that's the only thing holding me back from that right now is finding keen game takers. <laughs> keen players. All right, so we'll just let that kind of cool. Normally I'd be running the cold water over it straight away to stop the cooking, but in this case I'm okay if they, they soften down a little bit. Uh, it just means though that we will have to properly chill them before we toss the salad. Otherwise, hot potatoes with greens equals wilting. Okay, coming back to the mayonnaise, here we go. Like I said before, I have done this with a very fancy organic Dijon that ended up flopping it quite regularly. So I'm guessing it was either the turmeric or something that was in it that was making it flop. So we're just gonna start off with about a teaspoon or a little bit less even of Dijon. Now, if you don't have prepared mustard and you don't like keeping this around, you could just be using mustard powder as a spice um, and that will probably get you a more consistent result. So that's an option as well. Uh, and then we just need a pinch of salt to make this emulsion start out with. We're going to adjust for the actual dressing quantities and the dressing recipe ingredients after. We just need to create that base mayonnaise first, otherwise this can go pear-shaped. So we gotta make basic mayonnaise first, then we make it fancy later. And we just need about a quarter of a teaspoon, if not a little bit more. Uh, I believe I said the full teaspoon of apple cider vinegar, that's okay. Just to create that acidity for that uh, uh, aquafaba. To, to form this emulsion. So we're gonna give that a quick little blitz. So four ingredients to start out with. We have the aquafaba, the apple cider vinegar, the salt, and the Dijon. So give that a quick little blitz. All right, now I would highly recommend that you get yourself some cold pressed, ideally organic, but cold pressed sunflower oil. Now, not all sunflower oil is created equal. Most sunflower oil is gonna be highly heat treated, which means it's processed with a solvent, and a lot of those solvents contain heavy metals, which can still come through um, even after they say they've been fully cleaned of them. So I would recommend you get yourself a cold pressed sunflower oil. Uh, sometimes the flavor will be quite strong, so you might need to just play around with brands until you find one that you love. But this is probably the most successful oil to make your mayonnaise with, and it's the most neutral in flavor. Because if you try to make mayonnaise with olive oil, you won't be able to eat it. It's way too strong unless you're using a light, heavily processed olive oil. Okay, so now I'm not gonna measure this, but if you'd like to, you can. We need about a cup. The nice thing about an emulsion is, or making mayonnaise is you can make as much or as little as you like, depending on how much oil you add. So it's, again, we're not making the dressing yet. We're still just making mayonnaise. So this part can take a little bit of time. I might accelerate this in the video for you, but it's about two to three minutes of really slow oil drizzling in while we blend. So let's see how we go.
So the trick with mayonnaise is you have to add enough oil to initially get the uh, emulsion to form. Okay, so because we've got, I'll just get this and show you here. Um, because we've got so much liquid that we start out with, right, we need to add enough uh, oil initially so that we have a chance of actually forming this thickening. So in the, initial, in the beginning, it's not gonna look like anything's happening, but you kinda gotta reach that critical stage um, for it to start thickening. So in this case, I went by a little bit the sound of the machine. I could tell that it was really starting to struggle and that's because we started to have this thick, thick mayonnaise form. Okay, so we've got this nice, beautiful, sort of jellied mayonnaise, which is exactly what we're looking for, right? Now, sometimes if you keep going from this stage, uh, well, you can, you can still keep adding to it, but sometimes if you're, if you're not say scared, but if you're worried that it's gonna flatten on you for whatever reason, you can take some of this out and just keep enough down the bottom to keep that emulsion going. So in theory, you can create an infinite emulsion um, by starting with the existing mayonnaise and just continue to add into it really slowly. So hopefully on the video you could see how slow I was adding in the oil. And that is pretty important, especially for your first one, uh, because if we go too fast, then it can't emulsify it in quick enough and it'll all flatten. I think the science of emulsions is not really fully understood by, um, by science and what makes an emulsion to flop or to fail, but uh, we just and eventually just end up knowing what's working and what, what doesn't work, okay? So there's our mayonnaise. Now, I don't think we quite have a cup here. So um, ideally you need to get it up to that cup level. But once you have that cup of mayonnaise, then we're going to make it now into dressing. So you can still leave it in this uh, vessel to use the mixing. But what you might wanna do is if you are gonna make a bigger amount of it, you can take some of that out and leave it aside as just your nice plain mayonnaise into which you might turn into a garlic aioli by adding some roasted garlic, some extra salt, and maybe a little bit of uh, nutritional yeast or something to it. Or you might turn it into a Southwest dressing for a taco salad one night or a Caesar salad dressing, anything that you'd otherwise put mayo on. Now's the time to make it save aside some plain stuff, and then with the rest of it, let's turn it now into the potato salad dressing, okay? So <clears throat> I'm gonna pretend that I've got the full cup there. I probably am pretty close to it by now, but otherwise we'd keep going. I've also called for about a tablespoon's worth of flax oil. Now the reason for that is this is a very high omega-6 meal now, not a meal, a component to a meal, because we've just used mostly the cold pressed sunflower oil. Okay, and sunflower oil, yes, is higher in omega-6 than omega-3. So if we add in even just a little bit of the cold pressed flaxseed oil, then we'll be boosting that omega-3s without uh, adding too much more omega-6 at the same time. So all I'm going to do to this um, is add a little bit of that in, but I want you to take note of the color. So look how white it is now. Because the, the flaxseed oil is quite yellow and quite strong, we're gonna do a little color comparison once we finish putting that in. But you'll see when I drizzle it at how strongly yellow this is. So you don't need to put too much. Even like I said, a couple of teaspoons is gonna make a big difference to balancing out the overall anti-inflammatory effect of this, okay? Okay, so it has turned it a little bit more yellow. I think that's actually quite beautiful. And on the potato salad, you won't even know the difference, but we'll just kind of mix all that in, add it all up, and then uh, add in our other ingredients. So we're really close. Now all we have to do is make this taste like potato salad dressing, which traditionally speaking, would involve a lot of sugar. So we're gonna reduce that. <laughs> Unless you don't want to, then go ahead. Uh, and yeah, basically the combining of the fat and the sugar is maybe where we run into more troubles than the actual fat itself, especially now that we're gonna be using a good quality version, at least the best, best one that we can get for this use. So I don't know about you, but I love Dijon. So I've called for another tablespoon in addition to what we started off with for the mayonnaise. So three teaspoons equals one tablespoon. Okay, so we'll include that one. And 
now it's mostly up to you. How acidic do you want it? That will be determined by how much apple cider vinegar you add in. Again, I've called for about a tablespoon of extra. So we'll do that. And keep in mind here too now, this is, this is a dressing, which like a sauce, when we taste it on its own, it's going to have to taste really punchy in order for that flavor to carry through an entire potato salad. So really wanna make sure that you're giving it enough oomph. And in this case, the oomph is gonna come from the acidity of the apple cider vinegar, maybe the Dijon flavor, maybe a little bit of saltiness and or a little bit of sweetness. Okay, those are the, the oomph. And, and basically the technical term for that is the parts of our tongue responsible for taste. So sweet, sour, salty um, is what we're kind of after here. So in terms of salt, um, I've said one and a half teaspoons. That is a half, so we're gonna need at least another one and a bit of those. And again, keeping in mind how many servings that this is gonna be stretched over. That's actually not, not a very lot. And I don't know about you, but I think potato salad needs lots of pepper. So go as nuts with that as you'd like. We can always put more on top as well. Okay. And that little bit of coconut sugar or honey or nothing or whatever you prefer. But in this case, because we're using the apple cider vinegar instead of lemon, for example, it can be quite pungent, quite, sorry, quite acidic. Um, so we're just gonna counteract that with a little bit of coconut sugar. So just a couple little, little spoons of that. It's not to make it taste sweet, it's more just to take that edge off. And then the paprika, but the paprika is completely optional and it might be something that you actually wanna sprinkle on top as more of a decorative um, feature. So regular paprika, if you just want that flavor, or if you like sort of a oh, nice like smoky flavor to it, then we wanna go the smoked paprika um, instead. Okay, so let's just mix this all in. Another quick little pulse. Okay, and let's see how that tastes. Okay, yum, okay. Awesome, so if it's not quite right, just adjust it to whatever you think it needs, a little bit more acidity, a little bit more sweet, whatever that is for you. So coming back to our potatoes, we're gonna give them a nice rinse in the cold water. We definitely want cool potatoes to be able to go into this, otherwise we'll get a wilty salad. And if they haven't fully cooled, then you'll just need to wait a little bit while, and I'd probably recommend that you spread them out thin, either on a tray or a a big bowl just to kind of aerate them a little bit. And ideally, we would have done that rinsing before so they had a time to fully dry off of that. Okay. So, assuming those are fully cool, might be risking it, it's all right. You know what's gonna happen if they aren't. Um, the ideal situation of this was, was we would have had that rinse, like I said, right when they came out of the pot, and then that would have been perfect. A little bit of dressing on there. Okay. And again, maybe don't put all the amount of dressing on there, just until you know exactly how much you like on your salad or how much you're going to need. And let's toss it together and see how we go. So this is why it's nice having that big extra mixing bowl because then you have room to mix. You don't have to worry about spilling over the edges or being tidy with it all. So really get in there, combine it all. We'll actually kind of absorb into the potatoes and into the salad uh, if it sits for the day. So I would recommend that you use a little bit more dressing than maybe you think you absolutely need um, in this case. Otherwise it can sort of taste a bit dry and feel a little bit, yeah, a bit boring. Okay, we want flavor and punch in this. So we'll add that little bit extra. 
Okay, then when it comes time to serve, now's when you can transfer it into your decorative bowl. Hopefully having fun with it along the way. And this way then it doesn't make all the edges gross and dirty. So there we've got our decorative bowl of potato salad, at which point I'd add a little arrow bam of those guys and maybe a little sprinkle of some smoked paprika. There we go. Oh my gosh. And there we have it guys. AJ's version of potato salad. I hope you guys like it. Let me know, post photos, tell me how it tastes. Does it get the family's approval? What did you have to do to it? We'd love to hear all your feedback very soon. We'll see you guys on the next Cook With Me Live.